642. Ring the bells of heaven. 642. accepted in the beloved and therefore father we desire to be before you accepted Lord as far as how we have lived and how we need to live we need instruction we need exhortation we need your word to be uh, preached alive to us Lord and father we desire to honor the son uh, the Lord of glory who deserves all praise and honor and father we cannot do it without your power enable us to do it without the holy spirit teaching us how to do it and therefore father we uh, we ask that in all that we do at this moment will be done for your glory now because we have merits by which to ask for this and because we trust in the lord jesus christ meritorial work of salvation in our behalf in Christ's name, Amen. We'll go to page 95. Page 95. <laughs> Thank you. 
three. Jesus is coming again. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. We, but I still consider it an honor and a privilege to be here and to assemble with you as saints, as those who are in Christ Jesus, who love the Lord Jesus and the Lord. And uh, I just want to uh, bring up a couple things before we get started. On the, on the net. <laughs> That's, you know, it might be primitive beliefs, but we try our live streaming and things of that nature. But also for the matter of convenience, bc.org, cursor and hover over contacts, pop up says. Give directly through the uh, and it could direct and it deposits the bank account. You can do that as well. Also, I want to remind you that I don't know how to go over to the website, but also there's a place called Pastor's Blog. And if you go hover over that, Click on Pastor's Blog, and, and you'll see that from time to time, I actually do write something and put it up. And uh, I wrote this week concerning, um, are children more savable than adults? You often hear the argument, well, we need to get them young ones in here so they get saved, you know, because they're more susceptible to the gospel at a younger age. That's false. That's very, very false. Oh, you can influence children. You stir their emotions. You do all sorts of things. But the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. Children are no more savable than adults. Go if you'd like. And I hope that that is, will be a blessing to you as you do so. But this morning, I want you to turn your attention to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we'll look at verse 8. We're going to continue looking. Verse 8, this is the third sermon, and we haven't even finished the first phrase, and we So, uh, I don't know how much longer, brother, before I'll let you preach again. It might be... Never preach as soon as I'm done this, this. Romans chapter 8, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. I'm going to read it again. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ today. We thank you that you have sent him to be our Savior, to deliver us from our sin, who shed his precious blood on Calvary to redeem thy people, to buy us back out of the slave market of sin, and to set us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Father, we t t I pray that today you will fill our hearts with great joy as we continue to look at these verses, or at this particular verse, that we might get excited about how you work providentially in our lives, in every aspect of our life, how that we are the apple of thine eye and that all things work together for our good because we love you and that love being shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Father, we might magnify your Son this morning in the singing of praise, in your worship, and in the preaching of your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. A lot of people quote this verse, especially if they're having a difficult time, or if you're having a difficult time, they go quote this verse to try to encourage you and to maybe try to help you with whatever you're sustaining in this life. All things work together. And sometimes, you know, we can to do that, don't we? We come up with a verse without actually knowing what it says. 
and will quote this verse to someone who's had a hard time says, remember the Lord said all these things that work for good to them that are the called them that love God. You see, and if you love God, then everything's going to work out in the end. That's sh very shallow. Very shallow. And so when I pray, give this to you as something that is shallow. I want you to grasp what Paul has written here, as well as in the rest of the scriptures as I preach through them. I want you to know what it means when it says, and we know, and what it means when it says uh, that all things work together. I want you to know what that means. Know these things and reflect on how you have experienced these things in the past, and then also, and in the future, your these things will help you, your knowledge of this verse will help you in the things that are yet coming into the future. So, um, I don't want to be shallow about it. And though, I, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not going to get to the depths of this verse either. Many of these scriptures are so deep, so deep, that I can't, I, I don't, I don't even know the bottom, you know, you've heard of a lake, they haven't found the bottom of a lake or bottom of an ocean or something. This is bottomless. I just, I can't get it from here, from, from where I'm at, I can't seem to get to the very bottom. But you know what, I'm going to try deep to enjoy God's grace and then I hope to relate that to you so that you can have rejoicing in it. Now last week we started with the positiveness involved. We know there are some things that we are to know and can know and I started off with the fact that we can know that we are in a state of grace. This is something we can know. This is something Experience. We experience it through the through being regenerated, born from above. We experience, it, and we experience this grace, faith. So we, we started out with the fact that we we can we know in a state of grace by the fact that we have the abiding obedience because we love God, and then we spend some time in the fact that we that loving God is a manifestation of being in a state of grace. You cannot love God apart from being in Christ. And we know that as we look at the, that one of the, the, well, it says the fruit of the Spirit. And one, the first thing it says is love God and love of the brethren. All of these things prove state of grace. And, and uh, we know that because he says, my sheep and they follow me. It's a natural thing for us to follow. And we keep his commandments. In John 14, 21, it says, He that hath my commandments, them, he it is that loveth me. And I will love him and will manifest or reveal himself to us. This is a blessed grace that we have being in Christ. Not only do we love him and he loves us, but he reveals and manifests himself to us. We also know that we're in a state of grace because of, we have the spirit of love for other believers. We, an, we, it is not, you know, we often equate love with, we need to move beyond the emotion of love to obedience to Christ and the service yielding to one another. That's part of says, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion for stumbling. And by this we know the that we love the children of God, we love God and keep his commandments. When we love God and keep his commandments, it, that, that's a, then we will also love the brethren. We'll love one another. And we talked about the various forms that this love can take. We talked about how that love 
but the multitude of sins. We want to think the very, very best of our brother and sisters. We want to help one another. We're always available to help one another. And we often, and we're to, we're to actually inquire, how can we help you? How can I, how can, how can I minister to you and to your needs? One of the ways that you put to love the brethren is when you pray for them. Do you pray for each member of this assembly? I pray for you because I, my job is to service you in the gospel of Christ, to preach to you the word of God, to minister to you of the word of God, and then as much as possible of everything else that I have as well. You call on me, say, preacher, I need you know what I'm to do? Because I love you, I'm to give you my time and my effort as part of, as part of love to brethren, as you, me, and to one another. It's in the service of one another. So it's, we show we're in a state of grace because we have the spirit of love for the believers. And, and uh, the third thing I want to deal with is that we know that we're in a state of grace by a spirit of holiness. Spirit of holiness. This is a sanctified life. This is our life of sanctification. You know, when God saved us and imparted to us of his spirit, we refer to that as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? And if we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, then we have the spirit of holiness within us. We ought to have a desire to be holy and to follow after holy things. The very It is very much expressed. We, we, have, we very much have the expressed will of God before us, do we? Do we not? When we read the scripture, and it says, abstain from fornication, for this is the will of God, would that not be the manifested will of God regarding sanctification? Fornication has to deal with any sexual immorality. And so there, and then he talks, uh, there's other scriptures that talk about, uh, uh, um, not exhortation, uh, <laughs> it's, we take from, uh, boy, my mind just not going to, when you, when you take, when you uh, force somebody to give you money, Extortion. There we go. I just couldn't get there. We're, the Bible tells us we're not to be involved in extortion. And we're not supposed to be involved in, in lust. And, and, and not just a, we think, a lot of times we think of lust just simply as, as in the realms of fornication. But what about gluttony? Isn't that a form of lust and covetousness and all of these things that the Bible tells us that very clearly teaches us that we're not to be involved in? You could go over to the moral commandments of God and we could know what is the Lord's will regarding sanctification because these things God commands us not to do. We know it's wrong to use the Lord's name. Now, oh, I've heard Christians say, oh my G, oh, oh, OGM, that's what it is, it was, OMG, that's what it is. And I go, shame on you, in my mind, I'm shame on you to use that term, is to use the Lord's name in vain. I've never gone to a pizza restaurant. It's Friday. Don't know. That, that, that. You know why? Because it, they're using the Lord's name in vain. And when they say, oh my God, are they not using the Lord's name in vain as a, just a, a, a general profane expression? And the Bible clearly tells us that we're not to use the Lord's name in vain or, vainly, or wickedly or use it in a profane, secular manner. That's what the word profane means. It means secular. Guess what profanity is? It's profane language. It's a language this. And it's not to be the language that Christians because the Bible tells us what our speech is to be like. It's to be seasonable. It is to be appropriate. In fact, it's supposed to be to the edifying of those that we speak to. That's about seasoned with 
Well, I do not like to eat an egg without salt. Our, our, our communications need to be in love. Even when we, when we are reproving one another, we're to reprove in love, the scriptures say. The uh, sanctification that, we're, that the Bible clearly gives us in the word. It's the revealed will of God on how we're to act and how we're to speak. But there are certain things in that there's just, those are the things that God tells us to do or not to do. But there are many things in life that require discretion, prudence, investigation, by which we apply the for understanding and direction in our decision making. Now, there are things that are not covered in the Word of God. Like what kind of a job you could have. Other than what, uh, whatever this is to bless the Lord, but we need to supply for our needs in the Bible. We know that it's a revealed word of God that at least men work, that they supply for their. Well, and in fact, he gives us admonitions that if a man doesn't work, he ought not to eat. We also see obligations that to his family, to his mother and his father, to those who are destitute in his family to take care of them. Those are the revealed word of God. But how do you, what kind of a job to take? Well, the Bible tells us how we're to use wisdom and prudence and equity to determine what kind of a job we should take. You should never take a job that will cause you to violate any of the principles that are taught in God's Word. That's, that's the first thing. Make sure what you're doing doesn't violate the Word of God. There are many, many principles of God. By principles, we mean law or things that are set down, revealed Word of God, that we don't want to violate. So right there limits what kind of work that you're doing. I would not recommend taking up work in a game joint. And there are plenty of those around here. So you need to use the Word of God to determine where you for work. Will it keep you from spiritual things? Will those that you're acquainted with in your work tear you down in spiritual you're going to work among the ungodly. In fact, why do you think God has ungodly employers out there? To give places for God's people. That's part of the providential supply of God for His people. So we want to make sure that, that we don't work in a place, though, we're going to be put, put in a place. Let me put it this way. The Bible says clearly, no friends with the world. Now, they may be people you have to work with, but they don't have to be your friends. Because I'm going to tell you right now, it's the same principle with young people as it is with adults. When we have children, you ought to pick out their friends. Right? Why? Because bad friends will tear them down, and they will, be, and they will morally... And they will compromise in, in their moral stand. That's just the way it is. Uh, uh, what, is this, what is that? Corrupt speech? Uh, how does that verse go? Um, what's, say it again. Evil communication corrupteth good morals. Manners. 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 Same thing, right? <laughs> evil, con uh, evil communication, good manners. In other words, being friends with people of the world. In other words, becoming their friends, not just acquaintances. I'm talking about into a relationship, a friendly relationship. They will corrupt you morally. It's not the other way around. So I, I don't know how many times I've heard it. Well, if I go and I be, maybe they, they'll come to know Christ because, no, you be a good testimony before them in, as an acquaintance. And testify them of the word of God. Because if you friends, and I put friends in quotes, 
You will not be able, because unless you're willing to accept rejection, they will reject you for being a Christian. So if you don't want that rejection, what kind of thing you're going to do? Compromise. Compromise. You are going to then be corrupt, corrupted in your manners or morality. Now, now that's in my notes, so I don't know if I do this sermon. Well, I'm not going to get through the whole sermon anyways. <laughs> Just maybe not as far as I planned. Our daily walk, it requires not be worldly in our thinking, in our speech, and in our actions. As Christians, sanctified by the Holy Spirit and having the spirit of holiness within us, we need to, it requires that in our daily walk that we think biblically, that we speak biblically, that we, that our actions are biblical in our, in what we do. In other words, our lives are guided by the principles of God's word. Supposed to live. This is the spirit of holiness that is given to every one of God's people. Now, do we walk perfectly in these things? No. We destroy not in our own self and in our own works. It is to be the spirit of obedience that drives us to want to do these things. Therefore, we're going to spend time in God's word so we can learn how to think biblically, how to speak biblically, and walk in this world in a way that pleases the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get that through the word and in worship and in prayer because there are things that the Bible tells us to do, isn't it? Our lives are to be marked as, as those of the children of God. Marked. In other words, a child of God, I'm going to fluorescent orange everywhere he goes, right? <laughs> then I, that we identify as the children of God. We are instructed to put off the deeds of the flesh, are we not? It says, put off the deeds of the flesh, which are. And he gives us a list. And to deny lust. Now the flesh cannot change. Uh, there are people that teach this idea of progressive sanctification. Now, defend the, depending on how you define I may agree with you, but most of the way, most of the time, when people sanctification, a progressive work, I say hogwash. You know, because the old man will not change that old self. Who you are before Christ, that old nature by which you were born into this world which our dear brother eloquently spoke of in our, in our lesson on depravity, that old man is corrupt. And it cannot be improved upon. You cannot make the corrupt man less corrupt. It cannot. You can't make it better. It cannot get progressively better. It cannot be made spiritual. Now the new man, the Bible tells us, that's created in Christ Jesus was created in, in, in holiness and true righteousness. Now that part of you, the new man does not sin. It is uncorruptible and incorruptible. You cannot make it better. It cannot get more sanctified. It's as sanctified as it's going to be. So when you speak of progressive sanctification, what do you mean by that? 
define it as saying not getting better, but that as, as a believer in Christ, you are putting off that old man and that old flesh, and you're progressing in your holiness as a man, then I might accept that definition. The flesh cannot change. It cannot be formed. Now you can grow in grace, and if you talk about growing in grace as being progressive sanctification, okay, I'll accept that. I think we ought to be careful that when we I, I would I refrain as much as I can from ever using the word progressive sanctification. The only reason why I bring it up is because I want to hear it. I want you to know when somebody says progressive sanctification, you need to find out what they mean by that. The new man, because we are in the new man, and in grace, we're to grow in grace and in the strength of the new man, and that we're to cast off the filthy deeds of the flesh. That's what the Bible tells us. We're to cast off the filthy deeds of the flesh. That's living in the spirit of holiness. The spirit of holiness by which we desire our work and our lives to be acceptable before the Lord. Do you want your life to be acceptable before the Lord? Do you want them to be acceptable unto the Lord? A spirit of holiness wants us, wants, will want you to be acceptable unto the Lord in all things. In, in, Second Tim, in, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, it says, For by the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. Now, I'm not going to get into all of this. These verses, people say that the grace of God's appeared to all men. I, I tell you what, the only grace that has appeared to all men is the grace illustrated in nature. The heavens that declare the glory of God. Men can see the grace of God. All men can see the grace of God in nature. And then nature speaks of the truth. It speaks of the Godhead very plainly in everything that's around But men are blind to that testimony. They are willingly ignorant of that testimony. They hate the testimony of God and change the, the Creator into a four-footed beast. So the grace of God that has appeared to all men that bringeth salvation, that is to God's people, His elect people. Now, this, uh, I, I have some difficulties. I, I get really tired of everybody saying, not everybody, I, it's an exaggeration, but preachers saying all means all, and all never means all. It never does. You get on any of those literature books over there that I have. I've got, I've got, uh, most of my books relating to some, you know, philosophy or something. But, not philosophy. I, I, I think I've only got, I don't have anything over there in way of philosophical books. <laughs> But anyways, you get any of those books, and you can read them in the paragraphs, and they may use the word all. But what does all refer to? It all refers to all of a particular category, of a particular kind, of a particular... Whatever his subject is dealing with, the context dictates what the word all refers to. All never means all without exclusion. Because of the usage of the word all, usually there is... That is exclusive. Then someone's going to say, what about Romans 3? All have sinned. Isn't that everybody? Well, yes. They're all that's in Adam. It's an exclusive group. It doesn't include... Now, there are angels that sinned and angels that did not sin. So is it all going to include angels? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Does that refer to all the angels of heaven, all the created beings and beasts? No. 
Did the earth sin? No! It was what? It was brought into corruption because of man's sin. All, all, there's a limit. And it's always referred to a specific category or type or class, either of man or of beast or in creation. It's always limited. Anyways, that got me off the track of where I was going. I wanted to tell you, because people are going to quote this verse to you and say, see, all men, salvation's appeared to all men. Well, yeah, but you got to go to the next verse. What does it teach? It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. Who's us? God's people. Teaching us what? That denying ungodliness, I'm going back to my subject, Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So, how are we supposed to live soberly. Life is not a joke. Now, we can have a good time. We can have times of periods of laughing, but it is not. But we are to be sober in our religion, and in our activities concerning Christ and in our relationship to the world. We're to be sober and we're to be righteous. It says that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. You know what? People don't want to be, live godly in this world anymore. What does the scripture say? Those who live godly will suffer persecution. How many of you are going to volunteer for persecution this week? No volunteers? But live godly shall suffer persecution. Godliness is hardly ever taught anymore. That you ought to live as believers. And you know what we tend to do? We tend to camouflage ourselves and try to blend in so that we don't get pointed out. When I go hunting, I usually wear camouflage. And they say, why do you do that? You're colorblind anyways. <laughs> well, that's so another hunter can, will be able to see you. Actually, I don't want another hunter to see me. <laughs> I want to blend in. I want him to scare the deer out for me. We are not to try and blend with the world. The Bible doesn't tell us to blend with the world. That means that even in our dress, the way we clothe ourselves is to be in such a way that it portrays godliness. How we comb our hair, what we do to our face. Now that's more for the ladies and probably for us guys. We look in the mirror, the Bible says we look in the mirror, we comb our hair or whatever, and then we walk away and we forget what manner of man we are. Yeah, we uh, Guys are not, well, let me take that back. I take that back. There are some very vain men. Trim that here. Vanity, pure, pure and simple. So we're to be careful about in our dress, how we portray ourselves. When we portray ourselves, we're supposed to show that we are godly in our clothing. That means we cover up our bodies so that men won't look upon you to lust after you and that women won't look on you and your body to lust after you. These men that wear these muscle shirts. I don't have any muscles anymore. They're all, they kind of hang. <laughs> I used to be a very muscular young man. But why, what is the purpose of you wearing your, your muscle shirt? It's so that women will look at you and lust after your body. 
versa. Now, like I said, I got way off track on this, but we're talking about sanctification. The spirit of sanctification marking you out as a child of God, and we know, and we know that we're children of God because we have the spirit of sanctification. And it goes on, it says, looking for, uh, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. You see, we're to be zealous of good works. We were created for good works. I want to look at a couple of verses in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8, to start with. We've been talking about the fear of the Lord. That the key verse is chapter 9 and verse 10. Where understanding. Oh, uh, there's a knowledge of those things that are, those things are profane. But it says in chapter and verse 13 says the fear of the Lord we said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom but what does it say the fear of the Lord is to hate evil this verse has been on my mind all week or maybe even longer the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward or crooked mouth do I hate so what is the fear of the Lord? It's to hate evil and the evil, and evil practices and evil speech and everything that is against God we're to hate. That's the spirit of sanctification. Did you know that? Did you know the spirit of sanctification isn't just loving? It's hating. It's hating everything that is evil and loving everything that is good. Then if we go over to chapter 16. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Mercy and truth, by mercy and truth. God's mercy and the truth purges us from salvation. That's how we, that is how we put off the deep flesh is by God's mercy and according to that's why we what is this, what is the scripture that uh, young man cleanses that's in Psalm uh, 119.9 taking heed to the word it is cleansing mercy and truth iniquity is purged and by the fear of the Lord what happens men depart from evil. That is the spirit of sanctification. And then it seems like I've got another verse here. Anyways, that's enough. You get the point. The scripture speaks. Now, this is the part I'm going I'm gonna just briefly mention this. Another way that we're in a state of grace, is that we can know the will of God. Now, I'm not going to preach this section, although I've got it here to preach. You know why? Because I'm going to preach it when I get over to Romans chapter 12. It talks about, in the third verse, about knowing the perfect will of God. So I'm going to preach this. So I've already got part of chapter 12. First. But the will of God, you can know the will of God. And we know. What do we know? We can. We know that we're in the spirit of we're we're in the spirit of grace. That we have God's graces. But what else can we know? We can know the will of God. I don't know how many people get frustrated with their life because oh, I don't know what the will of God is. I sure wish I knew what the will of God was. Lord, strike me with lightning throughout the fleece. Give me a sign from heaven that I so I can. Oh. Send me someone to tell me what your will is. I don't know how many prayers have gone up concerning the will of God. 
And we know that to those that love God, all things work together. We know. We can know the will of God. And you can read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and I'll get over there and preach that eventually. But one of the things that I think it is really important, and I'm going to press here at this point, is that one of the things we need to do as believers is we need to learn how to wait on God. The will of God will be revealed to you. But you need to wait. Wait on God. And you know, we get really frustrated because we, we get in a hurry, don't we? We want to do things our way and in our timing. It is hard for us sometimes to wait. Just do what God has before right now. If it's just simply working in a job, working in a factory, whatever it is that's before you, going to church and serving the Lord there, that's the will of God for you right now. And you keep right on doing that until God providentially changes. 52.5 says, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Where is your expectation? What are you expecting, and where are you expecting it from? Are you hoping for some phone call, waiting for something just to drop in your lap? Or are you looking in expectation to God and waiting on Him to supply for you those things that you need and for Him to reveal to you His will is in regard to the mundane things of life? Now, like I say, we already have the revealed Word of God that tells us what He wants, which is... But there are things that, when I say mundane, I mean the normal things and activities of life. The things that we do every day, the people that we work with, the places that we go, these are mundane things, daily, normal living. And when God has a purpose to change that, He will do so. Waiting on God is of great importance. It's part of presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him. There's a lot of things involved there, where, weighing the issues, being aware of self and self, the desires of Christ. But we'll not get into that. I'm going to go ahead and stop now because we're going to deal with the particulars involved. That is, the all things. And we know all things. All things. All things. Is that all inclusive? In relationship to God's people, it is. As far as you're concerned, because it says all things work to good for them that love God. In the, in the original work together to them that are called to them who's he, who's he writing it to believers the righteous that's why I entitled the sermon if I remember what I entitled the sermon the providence of God for the righteous the providence of God for the righteous. You see, God's providence is in regard to us. Now, does this providence involve other men? Yes, but it's for our good. And their condemnation. Is that them? Do you think men being condemned to hell only for glory is it a good thing? They're not going to think it's such a good thing, are they? But to us, it is good. It is good. Father, thank you for being so good to us. 
that all things do work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called. And it is according to your purpose. Father, I ask that you'd glorify your name, that we might continue in those things that are holy and just, that we might live lives that are sanctified, separated, pure, for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen.